ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Well, things are going to stay on a, a quizzy level because it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Peter Bragg, who's a behavioural scientist from Monash University's Sustainable Development Institute. And tonight, it's all about decision making, in particular, the dilemmas, the multiple quandaries that multiple choice questions and multiple choice options give our weary and overtaxed brain. Peter, welcome. Good evening. What I've got for you is a couple of little short multiple choice questions, and hopefully that will help us illustrate, help you to explain what is going on with the multiple choice. So one I had asked earlier in the evening was about the number of registered marriages in Australia. All right. Now, it's not a, not a figure I expect you to know or anyone to know for that matter. So it's really a case of using your instinct, using your hunches, using your sense or anticipation what you think the right number is. Fire away. Okay. In 2020, how many registered marriages were there in Australia? A, 78,000. B, 107,000. C, 143,000. Or D, 181,000. What did you? What was your first instinct? I reckon it was B. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that? Because when I genuinely don't know the answer, I tend to go for the middling, the middling answer. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's probably not the smallest. It's probably not the biggest. So it's B or C for me. But I'll go with B. Is that? Does research suggest, or that's just Peter Bragg? Yeah, you know, that's the Peter Bragg theory. Well, I think it depends whether you're asking something where you think you might know the answer or not. And when you're actually having a rank guess, there's a few different strategies. I, I just went for kind of the middle because, you know, uh, Goldilocks, right? Small, medium, large. You tend <laughs> to gravitate towards the middle. And, you know, I imagine most people, it'd be interesting to see what others think, but most people, if they just don't know, they probably don't go for the extremes. Now I'm going to give you a little bit extra data. Oh. And let's see if you are inclined to change your mind. So you 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 gravitate towards B. That is to say, one hundred and seven thousand. Yep, that's the Goldilocks guess. What about? I remind you that in twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. the number was one hundred and thirteen thousand. Oh, see now I'm drifting mm -hmm. to C. Okay, which was one hundred and forty three. Yeah. Now I'm going to add one more factor. <laughs> Cast your mind back to twenty twenty if you can. Oh, yes, yes, there's a, there there's a, a bit of pandemic. A, there is a confounder in there. Yeah. Do you want to change your mind? And yeah, now I'm drifting to A, but I'm going to stick with B, even though I probably shouldn't for reasons that I'll explain shortly. All right. Well, that's what I thought. You have got great notes. It's always welcome uh, to use a specific example. That way we can really start to unravel what is going on here with the brain mm. and also with our sort of visceral response because... Were you to change the answer to A, you would be correct. Ah. 78,000. And there is data to suggest that sometimes the change, often the change, is a, is a wise move. That's correct. But there's a caveat or a couple of caveats. Let's, let's unpack what's going on in the brain and what's going, what went on even within your mind. Well, it's unusual for me because I'm on the radio and I don't want to be wrong on the radio because I'm a professor, but most people, even when they're not on the radio, they don't like being wrong. Mm-hmm. They don't like making a bad decision, particularly when they're responsible for the decision. So I'm sure your listeners today would have either been in traffic or in a supermarket queue. Yeah, for sure. And they see the other lane and they think, maybe I should go to that other lane. If you go to that other lane and it ends up being slower, it kind of ruins your day and you <laughs> think about it for the rest of the day. But if it ends up being faster, it's kind of like, oh, I just made a good choice. So whether it's, I was wondering whether this is evolution or not, but we are wired towards regretting terrible outcomes, particularly if we have control over them. So is that to say that we are more worried about being wrong than we are more uh, joy overjoyed by being right? There is that, and what that the consequences of that are that being wrong sticks in your memory more than being right. Uh -huh. So let's take the supermarket lane yeah, example, okay. right? Let's imagine it happens 100 times mm -hmm. and you're wrong three times. You will remember those three times more than the other 97 times. I couldn't believe that you went through item by item. I mean, really, it's true. You yeah, do remember, right? you do or remember someone in the old days, it'd be, it'd be you'd go and there'd be one person <laughs> in front of you and they're paying by cheque yeah. or paying with small coins. That's true. 
right? But but the thing is that then what happens is you get a false bias in your mind mm -hmm. because your recall of the times you got it wrong is greater than your recall of the times you got it right, it influences your decision in the moment. In your notes, you mentioned a, a maxim that was quoted from uh, 2000, the, uh, the Barons How to Prepare for the Graduate Record Examination, and there was something of a, a tenet when it comes to changing your mind. What, what's the, what is the thinking behind that rethinking? Still available online, mm, this really? manual about how to pass the graduate exam, and it said, exercise great caution if you decide to change an answer. Experience indicates that many students who change answers change to the wrong answer. I wonder why. I mean, what is that to say that they're scared of being wrong so the change is almost compelled by that fear? Correct. Mm. That's basically it in a nutshell. So uh, they've done surveys of university students even as, even as you know, uh, a few years after that or over the last few years, and there's still three quarters of university students and, in fact, more than half of university faculty that think it's a bad idea to change your answer. And yet there's been studies, there's another study that you mentioned, one that was um, almost 100 years old now, the 33 study rule that was published many, many years ago. Yeah, so basically a group of people in 1984, mm -hmm. they dug out all the research they could find on this thing called question answering or answer changing, and it turns out that there's studies from 95 years ago and looking at various combinations, pen and paper tests, computer tests, all sorts of tests, they looked at 33 studies, this was published in 1984, and in every single case, most times that people changed their answer, they changed from a wrong answer to a right answer. Which contradicts what the Barons' How to Prepare Guide says. <laughs> Absolutely, that, which that, was published 16 years after that, by the way. I'm thinking, I mean, what happened, though, with you with the marriage question was your first instinct was to go for the middle ground. And I understand, I understand that instinct because yep. often uh, there's a case of that's too low, that's too high, it's got to be somewhere in the middle. Yep. But then what took place with more data was more intellectual rigour on your part and you actually had the right answer right there if only you had the courage to make that change. Correct. I uh, suppose that's also too at the very heart of our decision making is how well informed are how how well equipped are we intellectually with this question? Yeah, and I think the the interesting thing is that we get sidelined by by this false belief that oh no I should stick with my gut. You know, I put it I put this out on social media. I didn't get heaps of bites, but most of the people who responded in uh, to my post, in fact, all of them, all two of them, said, no, nah, you stick with you, you stick with your gut, you stick with your first answer. Let's put the question to uh, listeners right across Victoria. If you are confronted with a multiple choice question that you obviously know, uh, don't obviously know, I should say, in case, let's go with that marriage example, then how, what is your strategy? How do you single out one answer over another? What do you look for? What are your tactics when it comes to a question that you've only got a very slim chance of knowing, but you're going to have to use your instinct, your gut, your savvy to try and navigate your way through that question. And this, think about it because it applies for things like e-learning exercises, dare I say, at the ABC. It applies for driver's licence. It applies for trivia quizzes. And it also applies in the life of Professor Peter Bragg, who is my guest behavioural scientist from Monash University's Sustainable Development, uh, Development Institute. I've got a couple more questions and Peter's got a lot more brilliant insights into how we can manoeuvre our way through multiple choice. It's now nine minutes to eight and we are talking about multiple choice questions and how our brain overrides or in, that, in some cases uh, defers to our gut instinct, first instinct versus that more intellectual second approach of putting the question to more rigour. Okay, Peter, now I've actually, something I prepared earlier. This is, a, a, I guess, a, a trivia question, one that uh, might even appear on a fantile wrapper. Mm -hmm. It's one that you will know or not know, and I'm imagining you won't know it, so this is a case if you really have to kind of, again, go with your go with your instincts okay. and play at home if you like. 1300 777 if you'd uh, mm -hmm. like to tell us about your strategies for multiple choice. All right, this is a about Hugo Weaving, the actor. Oh. Okay. In which country was actor Hugo Weaving born? A, Papua New Guinea, B, England, C, Nigeria, D, Australia. Hmm. 
I hope my boss isn't listening because I'm not from one so far and I don't really want to get too. You're not expected. So you're not expected yeah, to flourish you, here. Right, this is not your right. expectation. Okay, I'm going to say PNG. Mm-hmm. Why? I was hoping New Zealand would be on the list because mm-hmm. I've got a funny feeling he wasn't born in Australia, and I think he was born closer to Australia than England. Although England could be the answer, we're going to stick with Papua New Guinea. My instincts, were I to look at this, is either to go for Papua New Guinea or Nigeria. I would not go for Australia or England because my thinking would be, well, why would they single out that fact if yes. it's really quite, you know, uh, prosaic? England or Australia, there's no surprise in that. But then maybe they're trying to get you by the fact That's that you it. might think that there's no surprise, which is like a flipped, then you th- have to think through it again, right? This is what's so weird about multiple choice. You try and work out what the strategy of the questioner is, yep. not just the question itself. So what is the questioner trying to, where are they trying to lead me and mislead me? Yeah. You had the right instinct. It's not Papua New Guinea, it's Nigeria. His right. father was in British Petroleum. So right. he, he grew up in Africa, came over here when he was five or six. Yeah. But you're right. It's it. I went for more, I would have liked you gone for one of the two more uh, exotic answers with that thinking this is about trying to trip you up with an unlikely fact. But the context matters too, doesn't it, right? So let's say it was a trivia night. Yeah. You might think they're more likely to try and trick me with this. Yeah. So maybe I'll go to a, for Australia or England. So, like, the context matters as well. It does. Uh, and and then there's, there's there's all sorts of other norms apart from go with your gut. So I, I was saying to um, your producer the other day when ben, we, we were talking about this, um, I was saying, you know, some people at uni, when I was at uni, they just go... I'm just going to go A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D the whole way through, <laughs> right? Because I really don't know this and, I, look, probably <laughs> why wouldn't you go all A? I don't know. Some people just think that that feels right. It doesn't feel like they'll all be A. I, I also am of the belief that it's a series <laughs> of multiple choice questions and I know that the last two have been C. The third one can't be C. It's it's the Rosencrantz and Guildenstern myth that if you think after five coin tosses and its heads, that the next one's got to be tails. Um, but are you wiser to go on a random A, B, C, D, or are you better, if you don't know, if it's a question, let's say, about Russian grammar, 10 questions, <laughs> are you better off just saying C the whole way or just one pick a letter wow. and go the way? Yeah, I did. look, it's just as well I don't do teaching because I would be inclined to say, and, and, you know, people who know a lot more about probability than me would probably say these are independent events. It's like saying... It's like saying I bought a lot, winning lottery ticket from that store, yeah. so I'm going to go back there. <laughs> Absolutely no difference. Independent events, but you still kind of think, well, you know, maybe the gods were smiling at me when I went to that store. <laughs> Cause and coral. Aaron and Fairfield, hi, David and Peter. I had a school teacher who set us up a practice multi-choice question. All answers were C. No one got 100%. We all doubted ourselves and changed answers. The lesson, believe in your answer. Ah, it kept, so, yes, so the, the, the thing I did want to make sure is that it doesn't mean that changing your answer is always going to be right, right? Mm-hmm. So you can be wrong and not change your answer and you can be wrong and change your answer, right? But what the, what the research says on this is the key thing is to actually think about your answer and if you think that you might be wrong, don't not change your answer because of that myth about going with your gut. So it's it's a deceptively simple piece of advice. It's basically saying, think about your answer and if you either recall more information or, as in the example earlier, you are presented with more information and you think, I should change my answer, you should change your answer. I also believe that there is some wisdom, and I don't know if this is to folkloric, but you tend to think more once you have, not committed, but once you have tested an answer. You put an answer out there in pencil, so to speak, And then you've actually started to reflect on that. Correct. That's what I'm putting my name to. Am I happy with that commitment? Yeah, and that's called, I mean, that's called metacognition, thinking about your thinking. So the interesting thing about this research, although we've been talking about multiple choice questions, is it actually applies to any, like if you write an answer to a question Mm -hmm. and you think, actually, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that person did come from Papua New Guinea. Well, should I change it? It's the same, it's the same theory. All of those studies covered all different testing scenarios and the interesting fact about the fact that all of them showed that most times you go from wrong to right probably means that our brain is actually a bit smarter than our gut. There's another theory too that when you're doing a crossword, you are often more informed by putting a wrong answer in to realise that it is wrong and it's not just by all the other cross letters. You can see, you can test your answer against the sort of your own understanding of 
of the universe of a crossword or of grammar systems. You can think that is what I'm thinking the answer is, but by putting it there, you kind of almost stress test it. So which lane should I get in when I'm at the uh, supermarket, Peter? <laughs> that is an unanswerable question, David. <laughs> but um, I think that you, whatever choice you make, I can guarantee you will not remember it if it was the right choice. <laughs> Repent at leisure if, uh, if you do. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Lots of texts have as well. It's, um, let's, let's try and make a, a few more multiple choice options uh, for our chats about how the brain works. Thanks for coming in, Peter. Thanks for having me, David.